All right, well, in our time together today, my hope and expectation is that we will be able to finish our discussion on enterprise systems and, and maybe be in a position to start into financial accounting. But even if we can't do that, we should be positioned to start into that discussion when we, when we get together next week. We had left off, as Roger was just referring to, with our discussion on the material master. And we uh, had pretty much come to a, the conclusion of that material. We had one slide left, though, that, that I don't think we talked about last time, which is this slide that talks about all the different processes that the material master is used in. And we're not going to dig into this in great detail, but I, I do want to just talk about it here briefly. The material master is obviously used in procurement. The people in procurement need to know things about the materials that they are expected to buy. And in fact, on the procurement view in the material master, uh, the purchaser for that particular material is, is actually assigned. And, and some of these things I, I want us to look at today in the ERP system. So let me get logged on here real quick and, and we'll, we'll look at some of these things here as, as we're talking about it. So give me a moment. Bless you. We are, are we client 304? That's what we're using, right? I always forget that. Last year, coincidentally, it was 303, and I always want to type that. Okay, so material master, logistics, material management, material master. If I can get that to open. Uh, material and display. So if we look at any given material, and remember we talked about last time that the material type governs what kind of views we're going to see. So I would need to find a material that we actually purchase, and I believe we purchase uh, hex nuts, for example. So if we go to look at the hex nut view, you notice one of the options I can select the purchasing view, and uh, we'll stick with the Miami plant. Nope, that particular material does not exist in the context of the Miami plant. A good illustration of what we talked about last time about the segregation between organizational entities as it comes to viewing the various views here. And so you'll notice that one of the things here that is on the purchasing view is the assignment of a purchasing group. Remember last time we talked about purchasing organizations versus purchasing groups. Purchasing organizations handle the purchasing of things strategically. Purchasing groups handle the actual buying of stuff. And what this tells me is that in the context of my Dallas plant, the purchasing of this material is handled by purchasing group N02. And so we don't have a great diversity of purchasing groups in our lab work just to make your life easy. As a matter of fact, I think you pretty much just have one purchasing group, which is the North American purchasing group. But in a real organization, we might have many, many different purchasing groups and different materials would be assigned to different groups. The idea being you might have a purchasing group with expertise in certain kinds of products, and so they buy all of those products, whereas a different purchasing group purchases other kinds of things. So clearly, Material Master is, is a key document, or a key master record, rather, in procurement, fulfillment things related to sales. Now, it's very important for us to realize that things like pricing are not a part of the master record. Let's think about that for just a second. Why would pricing not be associated with the master record for a particular item that we are selling? Too dynamic. It's a great answer. We use all kinds of different prices for all kinds of different customers. It changes with great frequency. That doesn't belong on the material master. But we do see things like inventory levels. The number of something that we have in stock can be accessed through the material master. That's obviously a key element in the fulfillment process. Production. Later on this semester, we'll look at the MRP process, 
We'll look at other things related to production. A lot of production data is stored in the material master for those items that we actually do produce. I referenced MRP a moment ago. That really spans the gap between production and material planning, but a lot of information that we would need to incorporate into the planning process for a material is found in the material master. I had a little bit of a conversation about this last time, I think, but keep in mind that a material could be things that we buy a lot of, like what we looked at a moment ago, a hex washer. But a material could also be something that we buy very infrequently, like a delivery truck or a piece of manufacturing equipment. That technically is still a material. We might only own one of them, but we bought it. We have to track it as an asset, and so it has a material master record associated with it as well. If we are doing project management, the material master may come into play as we are thinking about projects that we are working on because we may be leveraging those materials as a part of one or more of the steps in the project being managed. So there's an intersection there. And then life cycle data management. We actually looked at a link that were related to life cycle data management last time we were together where you could actually link the master record to blueprints, to product schematics, and other things of that sort. So the material master is a really, really important block of information that we keep track of in our enterprise information systems. If this gets screwed up, if this doesn't contain accurate information, it could affect a whole lot of things in our organization, which is why companies go to great lengths to make sure that they have in place effective master data management. Master data management includes such things as who can access certain master records, who can change them, what kinds of changes are permissible, how we manage change over time, all of those things that relate to the maintenance of these master records falls under that umbrella of master data management. So that kind of wraps up our discussion, at least at this point, about the material master. We will come back and look at this, I'm sure, in other processes as the semester goes on. Any questions, though, about this before we start to transition to something else? All right, I have one question for you, and I actually just gave you the answer to this about two minutes ago. What determines the views that are available slash defined for a material? Material master, material type, material group, or material segment? Who can give us the answer for this one? Material type is the answer here. Now let's talk about this for just a moment. Material master is the master record itself. So although that's a valid term, it doesn't really make sense as an answer here. Material group is a thing, but remember we said that material group are just those arbitrary groupings that we create for the sake of helping us in various planning activities. Material segment is just a totally bogus term. So you know that one we could immediately cross off and in fact, material type is the one that is the, the correct answer here. All right, so in our discussion here of things related to the umbrella of enterprise systems, we have talked about a lot of things to this point, and we just have a couple of smaller topics here to uh, close out our discussion. And this was another uh, item that you had some homework questions about that most of you did a good job on. But let's talk for a second here about documents and the importance of documents in any enterprise information system. Really, most of our data capture, our data reporting, and our workflow as it is associated with an enterprise information system happens in the context of documents. Of that set, transaction data is recorded in transaction documents. And so we will see an abundance of those in our enterprise information system. 
the document principle tells us that once a document has been created, it can never, ever, ever be deleted. Why? Auditing purposes. Companies like Enron and others that uh, conducted massive fraud did so by essentially making certain transactions disappear. And if we have the ability to make transactions disappear, we have the ability to uh, present a fraudulent set of accounting records. Now, in the contemporary era, what happens to a company that presents fraudulent records, let's say, to the IRS, to the SEC, or to investors? Well, the leaders of those companies can find themselves going to jail. So one of the things that enterprise information systems need to do is give the leadership of a company confidence that they're not going to jail if the system gets used properly. So the document principle says documents can never, ever, ever be deleted. Now we talk about this more in the context of development, but let's talk about it here for just a, just a moment. We typically illustrate uh, databases um, with a graphic that kind of resembles a, a can. And so we know from a computational point of view, all of these documents are actually going to be loaded into various tables inside of this database on a computer system. And so we think of them in terms of documents. Logically, they are documents. But from a technical perspective, it's information that's stored in various database tables, of which there are a huge number of them, as we discussed previously. So how do we make sure that this document principle is adhered to? SAP operates under the concept of a sealed database. You will find articles in the literature, both academic and professional, that talk about the challenge of this structure right here in terms of system administration. Because what most companies are inclined to do is to have a database system like this and have a database administrator who basically has the run of the system and can do anything he or she would need to do. That's very, very problematic. Because how do you know that that person is not going to use his or her powers to commit fraud or to, in other, way, in other ways, steal from the company? So what companies have taken to doing is saying, we're not going to give anybody full administrative rights to this database. Or we're going to give a very select few people access to it, and we are going to very, very carefully log what they do. So hypothetically, if you're a database administrator and you decide, for whatever reason, to go into this database system and start manipulating data outside of using SAP ERP to do so, the system will in numerous places flag that the database is now unsealed. When auditors come, there are transactions they can look at to see if the database is sealed or unsealed. If the database is unsealed, a world of hurt is about to be visited on your organization because those records can no longer be trusted and everything is going to have to be examined down to the minute detail. So companies don't want their database to become unsealed. So for that reason, we limit our interaction with the database to interacting with it in very limited ways including not going in and manipulating the data in the system. Now, there's no problem with us copying this to another system. There's no problem with us archiving certain records. The idea there is that 
you know, a transaction that happened five years ago. We really don't need that data on the system. So we can move that to another system. We still don't delete it, but we move it off of our primary system. One of the things that is a facet of HANA, which we'll come back to later this semester and talk about, but S4 on HANA, which is SAP's newest product, the system automatically thinks in terms of hot, warm, and cold storage and manages that automatically. Hot storage is those things that are in your database that are being accessed frequently that the system needs to have very, very quick access to. So in the context of HANA, hot data storage is actually kept in memory. Warm storage is those data elements that gets access fairly regularly, but not as frequently as hot storage, and so it doesn't need to be as readily accessible. So we might put warm storage into flash memory, or depending upon our company resources, we might put those on hard drives. Cold storage is the example that I gave a moment ago of transactional data from the past. We might need to dig that up for the case of an audit, but other than that, we really don't find ourselves using that information very often. So cold storage might be things that are copied off to digital tape. And the system, in the case of S4 HANA, manages that for you automatically by profiling the data and moving things around. That's all consistent with this concept of a sealed database which supports this idea of the document principle. Any questions about that? One of the things that, since we're talking about this, that S4 supports that is really, really nice, and it sounds more fun than maybe it is in reality, S4 permits time travel. Time travel is the ability to, by way of certain transactions, say, okay, let's pretend it was last Tuesday at 9 a.m. Show me all the information based on that. And you can move back and forward in time and examine company transactions as they are occurring. We can do things like that because of this document principle. Everything that goes into the system goes into the system by way of a document. It all is time stamped, so we could go back and replay through history to look for things if we would find that helpful in analysis we're doing or other kinds of activities. There are a variety of different kinds of documents. Transactional document is referred to, it's not a bold print term on this slide, but that's one of the kinds of documents. Financial accounting documents you read about in your textbook. This captures the financial impact of business process steps. What do I mean by that? Well, this is literally going to capture debits and credits that correspond with particular activities. That's going to be referenced in the financial accounting document, and there would be other information as well. But if we ship out a material, and that shipping out of that material has a financial accounting impact, that's going to be captured in a financial accounting document. And we can look at that and say, okay, when we ship that product out, we debited this account, and we credited this account, and we can see the, the dollar values associated with this. Managerial accounting or controlling documents uh, similarly record financial impacts, but they are more concerned with capturing details related to costs. So the idea here is that a financial accounting document would, as I just mentioned, make reference to debits and credits. The managerial accounting document would not reflect that but would capture information related to costs that were a part of the business process step and would capture increased detail about the incurrence of those costs for, for later analysis. Materials documents, another class of document that your book talked to you about, record things like material movements. We took this product from plant 
Dallas and moved it to Plant San Diego. We took it out of storage location T1 and we put it in the new storage location T2. Everything like that gets memorialized in a material document so that nothing ever disappears and we have control over resources. So the bottom line is, on any given minute for a real world company, there are likely thousands of documents being created and updated in the system. And that's the way all of the information flows amongst the various business processes. Questions about this? Okay, so continuing that concept, what you will see on these documents is a very well-defined set of information that typically is reflective of organizational data, master data, and situational data, okay? Now, what do I mean by that? Organizational data tells us the, the who of a transaction from a company perspective, okay? What company code did this? What plant was involved in this? What storage location was involved in this? And so, a sales order. A sales order, every document is always stamped with a client number. We'll see that, that's universal. Every document throughout the whole semester. Company code. Why does a sales order document record the company code? Okay, that's not a bad answer, but it's not the best answer. What? Financial accounting. Remember I told you in your brain, every time you see company code, think financial accounting. Company code has to go onto a sales order document because this indicates which organization is going to be recording the financial accounting implications of this transaction. Plant and storage location are on a sales order, typically because that plant is going to be shipping out the material from a particular storage location. So notice all of the organizational data, these are things within our company that are going to be recorded on the transactional sales order document. Master data. Different documents will leverage different pieces of master data, but clearly if we are doing a sales order, now this is kind of interesting, this says customer, vendor, and material. This is kind of a general transactional data, but in the specific instance of a sales order, which of those is actually one that we need to cross off? What doesn't belong on a sales order document? The vendor, right. The customer is who we are selling to. The material is what we are selling. But for a sales order document, the vendor shouldn't be there. That's known to the customer's business where we bought the item from. Situational data, that's uh, you know how much did they buy, who put the order into the system, um, when did the order go into the system, thinking in terms of a timestamp, the where would be like a computer location and other things of that sort. All of that contributes to a sales order document, which is a type of a, a transaction document. So if we actually looked at a sales order document, which we will in a moment, one of the things that you will see is that every document consists of two sections. You have a header section and you have a detail or line item section. And the idea here is that the things that are in the header pertain to the whole document. They're universal for everything contained in the document. The line items all stand independent of one another. So for example, for a sales order document, we would reference the customer master data record, and there would be a reference to the sold to party and the ship to party. Now we'll dig into that distinction a little bit further this semester, but the idea here is you could have one company that actually is responsible for this order from the perspective of paying for it, and you could have a totally different location or even a different company that you're actually shipping the material to. So sold to party and ship to party 
are a part of the header section of a sales order document. Organizational data. Company code, listed. Sales organization, distribution channel, and division are listed. What do we call those three things when they're put together like this? Sales area, okay? So the company code is there because hopefully you remember from 90 seconds ago, that's there so that we capture the financial accounting implication of this. The sales area data is there just for us to use for tracking purposes in the future. We might use it for things like calculating commissions. We use it for things like tracking sales volumes in different ways. And I'll show you some of that in reporting a little bit later in our discussion today. Now, this is not an exhaustive list of all the things that are on the header of a sales order document. I'll show you that in the system here in a moment. Oh, we do have situational data here, though, too. The PO date, the PO number, things that come off of the customer's purchase order will get recorded here in the header section as well. You should expect to see on your exam and I don't know, maybe even a quiz question between now and then, but definitely on the exam, a question that would be something like, which of the following would you not see in the header of a sales order document? Now, I don't expect you to memorize this for all of these documents, but my contention is that if you understand the concepts, you can kind of easily spot what belongs there and what doesn't. So in my mythical question, you know, what, which of the following would you not expect to see in a sales order document? Sold to party. Well, yeah, you, you're obviously selling this to a customer that goes there. Um, PO date. Well, yeah, every document has a date, so the date is going to be there. Vendor. Okay, vendor doesn't belong. This is a sales order, not a purchase order, so vendor doesn't belong. So we could continue in that fashion, but if you understand the concepts here, you should be able to answer questions like that relatively easily. In the detail or line items section, you're gonna see a list of the items that the customer has ordered. That's a reference to the material master because you're going to use the material master code or the material number to reference those items. Situational data, there's gonna be a quantity there. You know, I want five of this, I want seven of this, I want 12 of this. And then you will see reference to the plant and storage location. True or false? On a sales order document, the plant is listed in the header. Okay, now that is not a question that you should ideally answer based on memorization. It is a question you should answer based on understanding the entirety of the situation. Why is plant a line item element as opposed to a header element? Absolutely. It could be shipping out of different plants. So it's one order from the customer. So it goes on to one sales order document. But they ordered some bicycles, some helmets, and some t-shirts. And those actually, inside of our organization, are found in different plants. So down here in the details section, it might say t-shirts, 17, shipping out of the Dallas plant storage location, uh, TG17. And then another item shipping out of a different plant and a different storage location. So if you understand that everything in the header is universal and everything in the line items are just particular to that line, it becomes very easy to discern, at least I hope, what goes where. So let's actually look at this in the system now that we've kind of talked about it in, in theory. So logistics, sales and distribution, sales, order, display. 
Okay, so I'm going to pull up any old order in the system. And so I'm just going to hit enter here. And here's all the different orders that we have in the system so far. Looks like most of them are mine, although whoever user 27 is has some orders, has at least one order in there too. Uh, all of you will have orders in here eventually as you continue your lab work. I'm just going to pick this guy right here, which is one of my orders, and hit enter. So this is going to show this to me. And this relates to now what we talked about, the header versus the line items. And, and it's not always visually denoted, but basically everything from here up is part of the header. And everything from here down, these are the line items. So notice we didn't talk about everything that's here. But we do see the sold to party, the ship to party. Um, we see the INCO terms. INCO terms we'll talk about later in the semester, but they're universal for the whole document, so they obviously would appear in, in the header section. The required delivery date. Um, where's, where's the reference to the uh, sales area? Well, ironically, we have to scroll down a little bit here. But right here at the bottom of the sales tab, sales area, US or 02 US East wholesale accessories. So reference to our division, our distribution channel, and our sales organization is on every sales order document. And you'll notice that's in the header section because that's universal. Well, now we get down here to the line items. They're numbered usually with in increments of 10. Here's an elbow pad that the customer ordered 20 of. And notice all of the stuff that we could put on a line item if we were so inclined to. I mean, you can just scroll here to the right and it just seems to keep going on and on and on and on depending upon, in our company's record keeping, what we want to keep track of. Notice some of the things that scroll by here, material group, price group, uh, purchase order information. We could record, you know, here if we scroll far enough, we see the weight of the individual items. Um, there's just a lot of different things that are recorded on a line item basis. And what you'll tend to find is in most companies exactly what you're seeing here, where some things are populated with, with information and, and some things are just left blank because we don't need all of that information in the context of our company's operations. So this is the sales order document where the header and the line items, notice there's just a lot of stuff here <laughs> that composes the different elements of this document. Some of this we'll talk more about as the semester goes on, but a lot of it is just beyond the scope of things that we'll talk about in detail. Questions or comments about any of, of the things we've talked about here as it relates to document processing? All right. Well, finally, we have arrived at the last topic in the context of enterprise systems, and that is a little bit about information handling. What I am about to tell you is based on what we will call classical or traditional information handling within ERP systems. And then at the end, I'll tell you how some of that is in the process of changing within organizations. There are two broad dimensions of data handling that we see within enterprise information systems. ERP systems and other systems of that type are essentially focused on being giant vacuum cleaners. They exist to allow a company to capture all of the detail associated with all of their organizational business processes. So if you were a programmer who was designing one of these systems, one of your primary rules would be that the system has to capture everything as it occurs. It can never lose anything. And we can never have a situation where we are unable to capture things 
Because if we're unable to capture data, people can't do their jobs. If the system goes down, work stops in most organizations. So everything in a traditional enterprise information system is oriented around this idea of, I've got to be able to take in this potentially huge volume of information, capture it and store it, and move along and be ready for the next thing to capture. Imagine, if you will, hooking a computer up to all of the cash registers that were in every Walmart store. And the job of that computer system would be to capture all of that information. So that's a huge flow of information. Well, that's kind of what we're talking about here when we say that everything is focusing on that capturing process. Now, the technical computer term that goes with the concept that we've just been talking about here is online transaction processing, or OLTP. Now, let's, let's take that term apart here for a moment. Probably most of you anymore, when you see the word online, immediately think of things like the internet and the World Wide Web and things like that. That is not what this is a reference to here. We have to think for a moment about the world before there were computers in business. And if we go back to the 1950s, 1960s, and even 1970s, business records happened on paper. There were no computers. Everything was done on paper. Well, then there was an era when companies first started buying computers, but it wasn't like everybody in the company had a computer on their desk. Instead, we had this really about a decade or more where companies had computers and they were in these like special rooms and the people that worked in there were allowed to touch the computer, but outside of those, you know, half a dozen or a dozen people, nobody else in the organization had any direct interaction with the computer. And the primary way that information was fed into the system was by punch cards. And so what would happen is literally the, the sales clerks, when they would get a call and it was an order from a customer, they would write the information down on paper and then potentially they would go to a key punch machine and key punch in that customer's order onto punch cards. And then all of those cards would be accumulated and at the end of the day they'd be taken to the computer operators and they would run those through the machine and the machine would then record those sales and, and create output to tell people what to do to fulfill those orders. That was the era of what was called batch data processing. You deliver data in large batches, stacks of punch cards and things of that sort. You fed it to a computer and it fed back to you batches of information, a huge printout of all of the orders and all of the picking things that needed to happen in the warehouse and so on. Well, when we move past batch, the next step was being able to put orders into the system, not in batches, but as they actually occurred. So what term do we use to describe that? That's online. So when you see online in this context, you should be thinking, okay, this is online, meaning not batch, meaning that we're taking in transactions on a dynamic basis as they actually occur in real time. So traditional enterprise information systems were really focused on this idea of, I've got to capture these transactions as they occur, and that was their primary focus. Because it's kind of like that old video, if you've ever seen, of, of what was it, the I Love Lucy show when she's working in the chocolate factory. And if at any point you get behind in data capture, it's just all over because it's just going to accumulate and accumulate and accumulate. And so the power of the system that we need is influenced by the volume of transactions that we're going to be throwing at it on a real-time basis. So if the primary focus of an ERP system is on data capture, that raises another question, which is, well, data capture is part of what you want the system to do, but you also want the system to generate output, to generate reports. But the idea is that in an OLTP system, those reports focus more on utility and less on sophistication. 
So we're not looking at doing some kind of advanced visualization or anything sophisticated in an OLTP system. Why? Because that requires a lot of computing power. And if we start taking computing power and focusing it on creating output, we potentially undermine the ability of the system to capture input. And what has to happen, what is of primary importance, is this data capture. So in the very earliest ERP systems, you had very, very limited ability to create different kinds of reports and different kinds of lists. Now, what's the difference between a list and a, a report? Well, the idea here is that a list, particularly a work list, is something the system generates that guides the workflow for people. If you worked in the factory and your job was to go around and get items and gather them up to fulfill customers' orders, typically you'd call that person a picker. If your job was to be a picker in a factory or distribution center, you would go to the computer and you would look at a list of all the different things that had to be picked that day and you would just start working down the list. That's a work list. If you worked in accounts payable, you might see a list of all the different checks that need to go out today. And you would start working down that list and processing those checks and examining them and so on. That, that's a work list. Anytime the system is creating a list that's guiding work for people to do, we just call it a work list. An online list is a little bit more flexible. It's just showing you information from the system, but not necessarily related to, you know, you're working through a whole sequence of, of tasks. So the kinds of things that the system could show you, particularly in the early days of ERP systems, was really, really kind of crude. So, as you can imagine, the first customers that bought these systems were pretty happy with that. But then over time they said, you know, we've made a lot of investments in these systems. In addition to it being able to process our transactions, we really would like it to help us in decision making. So, can we add another facet to the system? And this other facet came to be called analytics or analytic processing. Now, transaction processing is primarily focused on capturing the transactions and processing the transactions in a business process. Analytic processing is this idea of can I aggregate the information? Can I summarize the information? Can I cut it up into different pieces? Can I look at it from different perspectives in order to get insight? So one of these is very get the work done oriented, and the other one is much more oriented to really trying to understand what's going on. We call this online analytic processing. So you will frequently hear people talk about OLTP versus OLAP or, or OLAP. And the distinction is OLTP focused on transactions, capturing, disseminating information, getting the work done. Analytic processing is the idea of looking at information to try and gain insight. So it was recognized in the earliest days of ERP systems that customers wanted to do some of this analytic processing. And so this was added as a secondary feature to ERP systems so that you could use it to capture your data, but then if you wanted to do some analytics, you could do this. But here's the thing. We can't bog the system down. So let's assume hypothetically, and I'm gonna use my example here, recycle my database picture here. Let's assume that for a given company of decent size, we take in one million orders a day. Okay, Let, let's, let's think about this in the context of your, your Muesli company that used to run for ERP SIM. And let's imagine that your company takes in a million orders a day. And so your system stays pretty busy pulling in those, those orders and processing those orders. 
So we don't want to impede that in analytic processing. So how do we let you engage in analytics on this? What we can't do is we can't have you asking the computer to go into the database and parse through that information in great detail. From a database perspective, this would be things like executing a very sophisticated select statement where you say select these orders that have this characteristic and this characteristic and this characteristic. Those kinds of things add processing load to this system. So what we want to do is we want to deliver analytics to you without hurting the performance of this system. So we have a compromise. The compromise is something called information structures. Now let's think of it this way. Your Blueberry Muesli company, unless you're playing ERP Sim this semester, because it's changed now, but historically, your ERP Sim Muesli company could sell six different products. If I told you to write a program to tell me how many boxes of each flavor we sold today, you could actually structure the logic of that program two ways. One way would be, at the end of the day, you could go back through all of the records and add them up. That's very processor intensive. The other thing you could do is if you knew that at the end of the day you had to produce a report that showed that day's sales, as every order came in, you could add to accumulators in the system that would keep track of key things you wanted to keep track of. And you could do that as the transactions came in so that you wouldn't have to go back later and calculate it as an independent operation. That's what an information structure is. An information structure is kind of a, a workaround as a way to allow an ERP system to give you analytics type reporting without it having to make a second pass through the data. It's using information that's accumulated as the data actually comes into the system. Now, let me just show you, and we'll look at a few of these, some examples of, of what we're talking about here. Um, I'll show you an example, first of all, of a basic list. So logistics, we're going to go into materials management, and we're going to look at purchasing for a moment. Purchasing, purchase order, list display. Okay, So you want to see a list of all the purchase orders we've sent out. That would be a basic list. So how do you want the list? Do you want to see a list by vendor? Do you want to see a list by material? Do you want to see a list by material group? Do you want to see a list by purchase order number? You've got lots of different ways you can do this. Um, let's just say I want to look at all of our, and keep in mind here we're talking about purchasing here. Um, I want to look at all of my purchasing for, well, the system defaulted into uh, the hex nut we looked at before. So if I look at purchasing documents for the hex nut material and I execute that, I, I can see I, I, didn't, I don't have any of that to show. Um, let's look for a different material here. Um, I happen to know that I have transactions in the system related to my elbow pads. So here's elbow pads, execute. And we can see, in fact, that I bought elbow pads from Olympic Protected Gear. I bought 50 of them, still to be delivered, zero still to be invoice zero, so I know I got all 50 of them and I've paid for all 50 of them, and I can see what my cost was per unit. I have basic information here. Now, I've only bought that one time. If this were obviously a real company and I put in a material that I purchased, I would see one of these blocks for every one uh, of, these, of these purchases that I have made for a given company. Now, some of these feature drill down. So you notice I double clicked on that and now it has actually taken me to the purchase order where I can see where I bought these elbow pads. So a lot of these online lists support this idea of drill down. You can go into the system, 
you can have it present your report and then for things that you want more details on, you just double click on it and the system will navigate you to that. So the basic structure we're looking at here is this. We have a business process. The business process generates transactional data as we go from step to step to step to step. So that is going to go into our OLTP environment. We're going to capture that information. That is our job one. We have to do that. And so we're going to be able to generate very basic lists and reports. Notice what we just looked at. There were no fancy graphics. There was nothing there you know, of an impressive nature. It was just a here's the facts kind of presentation. That's the focus of lists and reports. So everything here was, was traditional. This was the transactional processing focus of a traditional enterprise information system and the way SAP ERP works. Well then, as I was mentioning, to give us the ability to do things a little bit more sophisticated, the idea was developed that we could think in terms of these information structures. And these information structures would be automatically pushed out and accumulated as the transaction processing happened. So it's very important to realize that everything on this screen is one computer system. But it's one computer system that's fulfilling really two different roles here. Because then I can take this OLAP information and I can do things with a little bit more sophistication. And this allows me to have an analytic focus to our system. Now you might look at that and say, well, suppose I want to do things that are really, really, really sophisticated. Well, I have a problem. Really, really sophisticated analysis is not the focus of a traditional ERP system. That's why companies would employ business intelligence systems or other systems that ran alongside their ERP system for the sake of getting work done. Now, let me take an aside here for the moment, and I'm going to actually um, give myself a, a blank slide to do some inking on so that this shows up in our uh, slide presentation. And you'll have it for future reference if you go back and watch the recording. So the, a, any questions about what we've talked about so far? Everything here is based on traditional ERP systems. All right, so let me ask you, and I think you really don't have to be a computer person to answer this, but I think probably it helps to have some background there. We said that OLTP systems, we had to be careful not to overwork them because they could start dropping transactions. Why might a system be overwhelmed? What are kind of the, if you will, the bottlenecks in the process here? What's that? Memory, Memory or I'm going to say more, more generically, whoops, uh, let me get my pen working here. I'm going to say storage, but more particularly, I'm going to say storage speed. If we go back to our assembly line thing, if you're working on an assembly line and the assembly line is delivering you things at 20 things a minute and you're putting them in boxes but you only get a box every 10 seconds, you have a problem because you're going to be overrun with new deliveries and the boxes aren't going to arrive fast enough for you to put things in. Traditional computers, traditional ERP systems, storage speed was a factor. What was the way, and largely still is, the media that we use for storing information in an enterprise information system? Disk drives, or more particularly, computer hard drives. Hard drives are slow. They can only take in so much information. And so at some point, we might have to slow down our desire to deliver information based on the speed of the hard drive. So one limiting factor here for OLTP systems was the storage speed. 
the other limiting factors closely related to that, and that's the processor speed. The computer itself could only go so fast. So the, the brain of the computer, the processor, is only fast enough to do this much work. The hard drive is only fast enough to do this much work. So we have to be careful that we don't overtax those things. Now, you could buy better and bigger storage and processors, but of course, all of that comes with more money. But even if you had infinite money, hard drives and processors are only so fast based on the limitations of technology. So this created a bottleneck for us. This slowed everything down and limited our ability to do analytics. And it's why we had to use one system for, for analytics that's different from our transactional system. About, we'll say, five years ago, the world started to change. One way the world started to change is because there were new developments as it related to data storage. Many of you probably have um, iPads, iPhones, other smartphones, or even laptops that obviously have storage in them, but there's not a hard drive in this thing, okay? Now, I don't know if any of you had an iPod in the earliest days of the iPods. The early iPods actually had a real small hard drive in them. The iPhones, there's no hard drive in here. Everything in here is what's called solid state. There's solid state memory in here that has taken the place of a hard drive, and it allows you to store data just like you could on a hard drive, but there's no moving parts, and it is a lot, a lot, a lot faster. So what if, instead of thinking in terms of my iPhone has, I don't know what it really has, but we'll say it has uh, 56 gigabytes of, of solid state storage in it. What if we started thinking of having a large computer that had no hard drives in it at all, everything was solid state storage, just like your iPhone? And maybe we could have a system, oh, let's just say that would have, where's my blank slide here? that would have, uh, man, went back pretty far here, that would have, oh, let's say four terabytes of just RAM memory in it that we used in place of a hard drive. And one of the really cool things that now you even see in things like your iPhone, you know, early computers, you had one processor per computer. Well, what if we could put more than one processor in a computer? What if we put 16 processors, or 32, or 64, or 128 processors in the system to be able to speed things up? Well, what HANA does, SAP HANA, is it says your old school database that ran on hard drives and was really, really slow, that thing's toast. That's old school. Let's move to a database system that puts everything in memory, has multiple processors associated with it, and everything is optimized around what we now know about computing that we didn't know back in the 80s when ERP systems first came into being. So what if we basically rewrote the world from ground up, taking advantage of what's available to us now? <coughs> I'm not going to remember this exact example, but Hasso Plattner, who was one of the founders of SAP and really the, one of the people that envisioned HANA, said that with a typical system and with a typical processor, the idea would be like if you wanted a piece of information, and instead of thinking in terms of retrieving a piece of information, if we thought of if you wanted a beverage and you had to go get that beverage, in an old school system, it would be like your beverage is on Mars, and you would have to fly to Mars, get your beverage, and come back, and that would take a long time. The difference in speed now is the difference between your beverage being on Mars or your beverage already being in your hand. You can drink your beverage a lot quicker if it's already in your hand versus having to fly to Mars and come back. So whereas old systems used to take a lot of time to deliver answers and process information, new systems are super duper quick. 
and you've seen this. Google, you run a Google query and the response comes back in a fraction of a second, no matter how weird a query string you type in there. How is it doing that? Massive parallelization of multiple processors. We're not using hard drives or anything like that. Storage of data in memory. So basically, if we take Google and move it to this idea of enterprise information systems, now we could actually deliver an enterprise information system that could do both OLTP, don't know what that is, OLTP and OLAP in one system. That's what SAP HANA does. And other companies are competing with their version of a product like this. So the big thing I want you to realize is there are still companies out there because this is very new and this is very expensive. Okay? It will probably be a decade or more before this becomes very commonplace technology. There's at least one company in this area that has hired several of our graduates recently to help them manage their company's transition to HANA. It's kind of a very interesting project to be a part of. But the old system was OLTP and OLAP, two different worlds that collaborated with one another. This new system now leverages advancements, of which this is just a part of all the changes here, to give us both of these things in, in one computer system. Questions? I mean, what you have is, is, as an example, some of you are familiar with the product Tableau. Tableau is a really, really nice piece of software. Um, everybody out there, well, for the most part, everybody regards Tableau as to be a market leader. Everybody out there is knocking off Tableau and creating their own copycat version of it. And it is built into these systems. So you don't have to buy Tableau anymore. You could buy SAP HANA, and there's a tool that's built into that that's going to give you Tableau-like functionality. Now, what actually happens is a lot of times to get access to patents and things like that, companies will buy other companies and then fold their functionality into their products. And so you're seeing that SAP and Oracle, to a certain degree, Microsoft, they're realizing that analytics is going to eventually not be a separate thing, but all going to be built into one primary product. And so they're buying those companies up and integrating that functionality. Other questions? This is the future. This totally changes the way IT works. Later on in the semester, I'll dig into S4 with you a little bit more and show you some of the kind of really revolutionary changes this can bring to an organization, but it ties in nicely with what we have been talking about here. Okay, so back to our slide deck here. Um, I talked about work lists. You know, work lists are basically parts of the system that, that tell people what to do. You know, you go in and you work in the factory and you run a transaction that prints out your day's workload for picking. And there's just a list of all the stuff you need to get and put into boxes, and, and that's your job. Um, billing due list, if you worked in accounts payable. Delivery due list, if you worked in the warehouse. You can see here, you know, outbound deliveries for picking. We've got all kinds of transactions like this in the system that are producing these work lists. The thing about work lists is typically they don't support drill down. They're just there to give you a list of things for you to work through as a part of your job. Online lists are more like what we looked at a moment ago where you specify certain things, you drill down into the system, and it's, it's giving you back information in, in response to your, your queries. Uh, let me just show you um, an example of this. These information structures Working with these is often done in the context of information system. Now, what, what I mean by that, you're going to see as you trace down various transaction paths, things like logistics information systems and human resources information systems, 
as a grouping of transactions. So if we go back to our ERP system here, and let's say I wanted more information about things related to purchasing, okay? So I could do this. I could do logistics, purchasing, got to find it here. Why am I? I'm going crazy. I don't see purchasing here. Oh, that's because purchasing is actually under accounting. No, it's not. There we go. Material. We purchase materials. So logistics, materials management, purchasing, purchase orders, uh, reporting. Notice here, purchasing information system. Okay? So in that set of transaction, notice now I have standard analysis, flexible analysis, early warning systems. This, there's a lot of functionality here that's going to leverage those information structures we've been talking about. So I'm just going to do standard analysis, and let's say I want to do standard analysis of, of one of my vendors. Okay? I want to see how, how good a job that vendor has been doing for me. So I'm going to start just with a general execute here. And, and this is all of the vendors in the system. You'll notice what you say, why are there so many line items for Olympic Protective? That's because every one of you has your own Olympic Protective vendor. So these are actually different vendors. And then you can see where, and this is probably mine because I've worked ahead of you guys a little bit. I have Space Bike and Spy Gear and so on. So I can see all the purchase orders that have been sent to them as well as the quantity of items that I have ordered. Now, as it stands now, if I say, okay, I'm just going to pick this guy right here, double click on it to drill down, and it tells me, okay, here's what you've bought. You've bought elbow pads, knee pads, and I can see the dollar amount, the invoice, I can see the quantities and so on. And you'll notice if I try and drill down on this, it actually takes me further into the detail here, but at some point here, this becomes less meaningful. There, there's no more drill down that I can do, but here, you can see I can actually go down and, and look at, I can keep drilling and drilling and drilling, looking at more information. If we back up, this is where we started here, and I say, okay, I want to switch the drill down here, and instead of drilling down on vendors, I want to look at purchasing by drilling down on materials. So I choose that option, and now I can see, okay, zero two water bottles. Double click on that. Okay, I've only bought those twice. Um, well, actually, I've bought them in the month of August. I haven't bought them at all in September. Double click on that, and I can see information related to that. But the point I'm trying to make here is I can switch this report. I can say, okay, I want to change the drill down and drill down based on plant. And so here's all my different plants. And now I double click on this, and I can see what purchasing has happened in the context, oh, that's interesting, standard drill down, not possible. Let's try here, I can, I can get some information. But this is all being based off that information structures. This is nice, this is useful, this is not super sophisticated. You know, if you've worked with Tableau, this is clearly not in the same league as the kind of functionality you have with that, but it is something. It is these information that I can get based on these information structures. D just to give you some terms here, what is tracked in the information structures, the characteristics are the objects on which data is collected. Materials, plants, sales organizations, things like that. Key figures are the measures associated with that. So, you know, we might, for example, think in terms of units for some products, gallons for other products. We might think in terms of dollar volume and things of that sort. And then time period. I want to look at this from last month. I want to look at this for two months ago. I want to look at it for last fiscal year. I want to look at it for this fiscal year so far. We have all of this that's happening in the system automatically. Now what's nice about this is when you buy your system and set it up, 
there's a lot of these standard predefined information structures that are in the system automatically. That's really what we have. What we have is standard reporting based on what the system thinks we're likely to ask about. But we do have the ability to go in and define our own information structures, which would allow us to collect different kinds of data in a way that made sense in our organization, and then incorporate that into, into our reporting. So this is the way that traditional ERP systems support delivering analytic functionality to organizations. The last point is, and I alluded to this a moment ago, what if a company can't afford HANA, which is the state of the art solution, but they want to do more sophisticated analytics than what their ERP system will support? What you can do is you can buy a business intelligence, or this is sometimes called the business warehouse software package. And what that's going to do is allow you to take information out of all of your transactional systems, copy them, or if you will, have that system extract from these systems the information it needs for the sake of you doing more advanced analytics on it. The key thing here is it takes the performance load off of the OLTP systems because this extract is perhaps going to be done in the middle of the night when very few people are using the system. So it pulls out information into this other system for the sake of you doing analytics. This is extremely common. This is what most companies are doing today until they can afford to take the jump to the next step that eliminates the need for this business intelligence or business warehouse system. And we're out of time for today. So I will see you guys when we get together next week. Have a great rest of the week and a great weekend.